Welcome back 2020 viewers. This will be the second in our series on ELF files and linking late stage in the compilation process. And it is also the final lecture in our entire course uh, for this semester. Uh, we are here at Monday, May 4th. In a few days, your fifth project is due. Uh, the submission link for that will go up on Gradescope very soon. So look for it later today, hopefully. And make sure that you're aware then a week from then is the final exam for most of you, 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. If you happen to have conflicts with that time, do let me know and we will try to make arrangements to accommodate you. Today is the last day that your formal evaluations can be submitted to the university. So if you haven't done so already, log into this uh, SRT student rating of teaching at umn.edu. Uh, so it has something to do with the color blue. Uh, so uh, plop yourself down there for a few minutes fill out an eval both for us in your lecture section, either 001 for the afternoon or 020 uh, for the morning, and any other courses that you care to give feedback on. In addition to this, we'll also have probably an online Canvas survey uh, that has some more specific details associated with the course, and it'll be due in a week and probably worth an engagement point, uh, so have a look for that uh, later on today. As for us, in terms of finishing up our discussion of linking, we probably won't make it through this entire uh, lecture deck. And so instead, I'll make a clear sort of cutoff here as to what is the end of content you'd be responsible for on the exam. And anything else is free for you to study if curious and free for you to ignore otherwise. We left off last time having discussed this long and immense journey that programs go on from source code to finally become a running process. Uh, we had made it through about half of that and tied together many of the things that we had discussed earlier in the class. Uh, this include things like talking about the compiler and its process of converting things uh, from source code into assembly code. And then how that assembly code, which is more directly understood by the processor, needs to be converted into a binary version that's fed to the processor. And we've discussed then this issue of .o files, surveyed just a little bit about the file format that's typically used on Unix systems, uh, this ELF file format, uh, and then allude to the fact that even separate dotos don't necessarily have everything in them that's needed to run the program. Instead, there's this notion of linking that has to happen. And this actually happens twice, uh, once at the compilation stage to produce a stored memory program. And at that point, anything that is desired to sort of be included with the program is inserted into it. But we've seen earlier that in most modern systems through virtual memory, programs can actually make, share copies of the standard library uh, for definitions like printf and malloc and so forth. And so there's actually a, a second linking stage, uh, which happens as the program is loaded into memory. Uh, this dynamic linking process then will occupy us a little bit uh, during this last phase of the discussion. So the traditional layout between these two tools that are used, uh, the linker and the loader, has become just a little bit blurred. To make that more apparent, uh, the traditional model was known as static linking. Uh, and in that process, any of the program files that are needed in order to contain definitions of printf and malloc or any other functions, uh, definitions for mains and helper functions that you wrote, they all had to go into some .os someplace. Uh, and all of the global symbols, that includes functions, global variables, etc., they all had to be merged into a single executable that's eventually uh, plopped out. The loader then, as a second sort of later stage of this process, had a much simpler job because since programs were self-contained, every part of them that was needed for execution was present in the stored memory ver or a stored file version of them. All the loader had to do was to copy those things into the proper parts of memory uh, and set the rip and let the program loose. Uh, this is a traditional model and had the major drawback that when you would compile something, uh, GCC would go fetch the definition for all the standard library functions, your malloc, your printf, uh, very large sort of segments of, uh, sort of code that's required by many programs, copy it into the executable that's associated with that, uh, and then produce a somewhat larger um, executable on disk then. Uh, this meant that you took up more disk space and it also meant that when the program was loaded, it took up more main memory because you had all kinds of different programs uh, requiring uh, their own copies of printf and that duplicate code that's out there just sort of consumed memory without real cause. 
So in the modern era, this dynamic linking process has supplanted that and put some more pressure on the linker and the loader to collaborate. And this explains to some extent why on Linux, for instance, they're uh, named very similarly, that LD is the linking tool, but it's also uh, to some extent the loading tool. Uh, in this model, uh, the linker actually merges all the dot O's to create an executable, and you have to resolve symbols, but it's okay to have some symbols undefined. And if you were to look at your standard A dot out, you'd see things like printf uh, are not defined in that. And if you poked around in there to try to find any sort of assembly code associated with printf or malloc, it would be not present. Uh, what the loader does then is as it loads the executable into memory and sets the rip, it also will map virtual memory pages that are associated with libraries that the program is going to use that are loaded if needed. And this dynamic linking process then means that programs can occupy less disk space and less space in working memory uh, as they're loaded up. It requires some more coordination and has some drawbacks in that the programs that you create are no longer self-contained. If I were to pick up uh, this uh, dynamically linked executable and send it your way through email, if you didn't happen to have the correct libraries or even the correct versions of libraries installed, then you probably couldn't run this. Um, this isn't as much of a problem with static linked uh, libraries. Uh, but dynamic linking uh, has historically proved troublesome at times because programs that require a library or certain versions of a library can't run on a system that doesn't have it or doesn't have it installed in a known location. We'll see some examples of this uh, very shortly. But it does provide a tremendous amount of flexibility and greater efficiency in a system uh, at the cost of some more implementation expense and complexity. By default, GCC attempts to produce dynamic libraries. This is uh, the de facto standard these days, though it wasn't always so. So as you would look, for instance, at a short program, uh, like this little main that prints out a hello world, uh, and you would GCC that with standard sets of options. Uh, that's just GCC called the uh, XQL has produced hello dynamic and feed it the source file hello.c. You examine what's the file type for this uh, in the next step. Uh, then you'd see it's listed clearly uh, as a dynamic executable down here, this hello dynamic. Uh, it's uh, L64 bit LSB shared object, the shared object part there, that SO uh, intends that it makes use of dynamic linking. The dynamic living thing is uh, fairly. Uh, um, uh, self-explanatory and then finally there's a mention here of a interpreter and this is the program that is meant to uh, take this program and interpret its contents this is the Linux loader uh, which is going to uh, load it into memory so that it can become an actual executable in contrast, uh, if you plop down one additional option to GCC, this dash static option, what you get instead is a statically linked executable. And that's clearly stated as such here. It's still an ELF file. It just doesn't have any of the dynamic linking properties associated with this. And being self-contained doesn't require as much assistance from a dynamic loader like ldlinux.so. There's one big difference then you can ascertain between these two. Uh, and compiling between the dynamic and the static versions. If you use this handy little disk utilization or disk usage utility, ask for how many bytes these two contain, you can see there's a significant difference. Uh, pause just for a moment. Relate this back to how big you expect each of these things to be and why. Take a moment, think that over, uh, and uh, we'll carry on in just a moment. So as we mentioned just a moment ago, the idea of being self-contained comes at a cost. So while this hello static doesn't require an interpreter, uh, it does occupy a considerable amount more disk space, uh, probably nine times as much disk space or so, maybe eight times. Uh, at any rate, uh, the consumption of 721,000 bytes versus only 9,000 bytes for the hello dynamic is a trade-off of what it takes uh, to copy in definitions for all of those standard library functions. 
And I expect if you go into hello static, you'll actually find definitions for printf and malloc and so forth. And this is because uh, the dash static option up here says go find a static copy of those library functions and place them in the executable uh, here so that this thing doesn't rely upon any external entities. Versus hello dynamic is, uh, dynamic is small because it expects when you load me, you'll actually attach the working image of libc with printf and malloc in it uh, so that I can get my business done. And this is confirmed if you do a little bit of deeper examination. We saw at an earlier stage in the class, there's this little NM utility that shows you what are the global names or symbols that are present in this. And learned now, some to some extent, uh, what are the global uh, symbols, uh, what does that mean in the context of ELF files. And if you go into hello static, you'll see that there is a strongly defined main that's in there. And also a weakly defined symbol uh, that is associated with put s. This is what printf tends to get translated to if it doesn't have any format specifiers in it. Uh, though weakly defined in there, it is defined. Uh, so it has a definition uh, for the code body there. On the other hand, if you looked at the dynamic version, you'd still see a strong definition for main, and there's a text uh, version of this thing. On the other hand, there is no definition for put s. It's undefined, uh, the u symbol over here. And that's because the, the cost of making this thing smaller is you leave out a lot of the definitions that are needed, relying upon the dynamic loader uh, to attach those and fill them uh, in with uh, definitions uh, through virtual memory later on. So this notion then of loading things at runtime uh, is interesting in that it creates potential problems. Uh, here is an example of something that I think is going to go okay normally. Uh, and it's worthwhile at times as you would encounter problems with dynamic loading to be aware of utilities like LDD, which can tell you what are the dynamic libraries that are needed. Uh, it's basically a listing of what's going to be required, which is nothing if this is a static executable, but is almost always something if something is, is a, a executable is listed as a dynamic uh, uh, or a dynamically linked uh, executable. And so running LDD down here on hello dynamic, something that we compiled with default options up here, which will cause GCC again to link this thing dynamically, it indicates there are a number of dependencies. Uh, that first and foremost, this thing needs the Linux dash VDSO dot so dot one. If I remember right, this is the Linux kernel, uh, or at least the shared library that represents it. Uh, almost every program is going to need that. Almost every program is going to need uh, libc because making use of functions like malloc and printf and putf and so forth, uh, that needs a definition. And so this has a dependency uh, on uh, printf uh, over here. So that is indicated in the output from LDD. It also shows then this dynamic library, which is needed, whether or not it's found on the current system and at what file location. And a lot of libraries tend to be under user lib, in this case libc.so.6. Uh, the dot six here is a version number, and oftentimes a system that's been around for a while will have several versions of this to support the programs that are maybe a little bit older and need older versions. It also mentions uh, the dynamic library uh, or the uh, virtual memory address at which this uh, can be loaded uh, to. Uh, but generally then that .so uh, extension is associated with a shared object, something that's to be linked against at, at runtime. And then finally down here is the loader itself, uh, that there's a dependency uh, that this thing exists and uh, is uh, satisfied by the function or the uh, file that's uh, present on the file system at this location, user lib64, etc. So uh, with that in mind, then, uh, we can start to look uh, at this compilation system then in some more detail and see uh, whether or not uh, you can actually fulfill this uh, or the, the dynamic limping uh, sort of business. I have a couple of uh, sample programs here, and I, I want to demonstrate one facet that you may not be aware of, uh, and we haven't touched on much in this class uh, so far, and that's the issue of how you actually link libraries that aren't there by standard. When you compile something like this, uh, hello dynamic with a hello.c, uh, most of the functions that are needed but aren't defined are in libc, which is almost always automatically linked to C programs, uh, as you would expect. 
there are some functionalities that you would get in the standard C library that aren't necessarily linked by default. And the first and most irritating on many GCC-based systems is math functions. Uh, and you'll notice up here an invocation that we haven't used directly in many cases uh, to GCC do math. And then there's, there's this little dash, little l, and then m. And the meaning of this is to link a library that isn't normally linked by, by default. Uh, in this case, uh, the uh, libm, uh, this is the math library, and this will cause uh, the executable to have available to it some uh, mathematical functions that aren't otherwise available. Uh, let's look at the, the source code uh, quickly uh, together. Uh, just need to over here. And here's do math. I'll uh, open it up on the right hand side here because we'll compile it shortly. Uh, you can see that I've done all the sort of standard stuff in here uh, that I have included my math.h uh, uh, file, well, which is going to make available the fact that there is such a thing as this me or the uh, mathematical constant e uh, base of the natural logarithm, that there are functions like cosine and sine and pow uh, present, uh, and then these pounds include state, state AO that gives me printf and uh, some of these others in here. Uh, so if I come over here and attempt to compile this thing, I'll do so with a GCC uh, and then just do math. Let's see, you can see we're intentionally compiling this wrong according to how I'm supposed to do it up here. But I GCC that, uh, then I will get a whole bunch of complaints uh, from the compilation chain. And generally when we talk about, oh, this is a compiler error of some kind, here we need to be a little bit more specific because it's actually not GCC that's complaining. It has done the compilation properly. And in fact, I can compile this uh, with dash C uh, and this produces uh, a do math dot O. And that's because translating this entire thing into assembly is not the issue at stake here. Uh, that can be done effectively and I can produce this dot O. It's just that if you were to look in that dot O file, uh, do math dot O, Math. Oh, uh, what you'd see is there are some strong definitions like this main function, but a whole bunch of undefined stuff like pow and printf and put s and sign and so forth. And it's only at the later stage the linkers takes its turn to say, okay, uh, I need to take any of the dot o's that were mentioned here on the compile line uh, and produce an actual execute from that by filling in definitions for stuff that that uh, needs it. Now, I haven't space specified where are the definitions for some of these functions. By default, I get things like put s uh, and printf and so forth, but I do not get uh, things like sine and cosine. Uh, this varies from one compiler to the next as to whether it will automatically link mathematical functions, uh, but in this case with GCC, uh, it doesn't. And so what you're required to do in this case is to explicitly say, as you compile, please link in the math library. Uh, this will happily then produce a dynamic executable, LDB here in my a out, uh, and it'll have an additional dependency now that as I would load this thing, in addition to the C library, uh, the loader and the Linux kernel, uh, I need the math library. Uh, and this is found in a separate library from the standard C library, uh, this libm.so.6. Uh, and you'd expect that being part of the standard C library system, it probably goes in line uh, with the same version number that's there. But this is a dependency then that can clearly be handled. And if I were to run this thing, uh, a dot out, uh, I have an option here now to uh, sort of have a look at what the working memory image of this is. And if you've forgotten, uh, remember this is a, a handy tool to have at your disposal, uh, which is the PMAP utility. All I need is a process ID, 14644. 4644. And you can look at how this thing has been mapped into virtual memory. And in addition to some of the things that we've seen before, like the program code and global variables and so forth uh, that are associated with this program, uh, and the C standard library, which is an important sort of part of this, uh, we now see one additional entry, which is the math library, libm. So this dependency is not a lie that when this thing is loaded in, uh, it actually is linked over here uh, dynamically. And if instead I wanted to do that statically, uh, then I'd expect to see uh, the output for this a dot out, if I compile statically, there to be a bunch of definitions for things like cosine and sine and pow and so forth in there. So this is a common feature of many 
compilation systems, very prevalent on GCC-based uh, Unix systems. Uh, and depending on the kind of application that you are compiling, you may need to add some flags and some options to the command line uh, where you're compiling to indicate libraries that are needed. Another common one that you may encounter later on is the pthreads library. This is used to create multiple threads of execution to either concurrently execute code or utilize more than one processor. Uh, something that's out of the scope of right now, but uh, it's suffice to say that the uh, support code for pthreads, uh, the library functions, so forth, they are not part of the standard C library, and so you have to pass an additional option over here uh, to link this libpthread uh, to that executable. It'll be done so dynamically uh, by default, and so it won't inflate your executable size too much, but it will uh, be required in order for the compiler at the late stage with the linker to resolve any undefined symbols that are present in there. So the default convention then that you should be picking up on here uh, is that when you want some library that has some functionality in it uh, to link using a dash little l and then the name of something like my stuff. Uh, this will cause the compiler and the linker uh, to poke around on your system to see if it can locate one of the following things. It'll first try to find a dynamic library uh, and this will be a file named libmystuff.so. Uh, if that can't be located, then the compiler fall back to try to find a static library. Uh, and the structure of these two things are just a little bit different. Uh, libmystuff.so probably has this dynamic structure to it, required special compilation to produce, something that we may have time towards the end of the discussion to go over, uh, versus libmystuff.o is a so-called archive, and it's just a glorified a whole bunch of .os in a special uh, sort of format uh, to make them easily available at compilation. Uh, and if, it can't, if the compiler can't find either of these things, then it will just give up and say, I cannot link against this as undefined symbols. Uh, and that's more or less the same option or the same set of errors you get if you forgot to link in the first place. Chances are likely then that you need to install this library somehow or make the compiler of, uh, aware of where it's located. Uh, you can force the bypassing this dot so by passing this dash static option again, and this will then create larger executables, but uh, ones that are self-contained. You can even ask that GCC uh, not link in the standard C library, something it almost always does unless you specify this no standard lib. Uh, I can't think of a good reason why you'd want to do that, and it would take some careful architecting in order to get your program to actually compile and run without the standard library. But I can see some instances in which uh, this would be useful. Uh, for instance, if you're creating some small embedded systems, didn't want uh, the entire C library linked against it, uh, and has some way to get your main function running uh, out of the gate. Finally then, in order to find this kind of file, you need to be aware that the compiler looks for certain uh, libraries in well-defined system locations. By passing the right option, you can actually get GCC to reveal some of this. Uh, the dash V option in this case for a verbose output will cause GCC to spit out a bunch of information as it does its compilation business to tell you what it's up to. And importantly, it has a couple spots that it looks for header files and for library files. Uh, this kind of output up here uh, indicates that there's a directory on my system called user lib gcc x64 security blah 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 uh, and this ending with include usually means there's a whole bunch of dot h header files in there uh, there's also a user local include a user include a user gcc uh, include um, there are a whole bunch of directories then that in its search for uh, sdio.h and math.h it will start by looking in this directory if it can't be found there, then it'll look in this directory. If it can't be found there, it'll look in this directory, and so forth. We'll do that for all of the header files that you have specified. And similarly, for all of the linked library files, uh, dash lm, there's a separate set of directories, uh, slash lib, slash user lib, etc. A common Unix convention is that you specify this little colon to separate paths in certain environment variables. And we'll get on that environment variable kick in, in just a minute. And these are, again, the locations that, as I'd be looking for, uh, libmystuff.so, first look in here, and then in here, and then here, and so forth. 
Uh, now this creates an immediate and interesting problem. Um, first, for some libraries that you don't have installed, uh, then uh, there's really no hope to succeed. But even for libraries that you do install through some package manager on your Unix system, uh, if it's not in uh, the required files, the headers and the library files aren't in one of these pre-specified directories, uh, then the compiler isn't going to be located, uh, able to look at them. You may actually have to sort of manually intervene and uh, indicate where those things are located, because uh, otherwise it'll give you an undefined error. I can't finish the compilation process because I couldn't how to figure out how to link this or that uh, function that you mentioned. Uh, to that end, we'll want to look at some additional options that guide GCC towards those locations. Uh, it also means then that when you would be creating your own libraries, uh, there's this notion of installing those libraries. And typically that means plopping down the header associated with the library in one of these well-defined locations and plopping down the .so or .a or both in a well-defined location like this so that users of the library don't have to um, fart around with uh, telling GCC where to find your stuff. But usually there's always a workaround if you can't get access to these directories. They tend to be controlled by the administrator and so you need uh, administrator level privileges on a machine uh, to install them there. This isn't a big deal and typically if you own your own computer then you have administrator privileges to install software on it. Uh, but if you're working uh, in some sort of a corporate or uh, academic environment uh, then you don't necessarily have access to these and have to uh, either work around or ask your administrator to install stuff for you. On that note of creating uh, and linking libraries, and we'll talk just briefly about how this is done uh, both statically and dynamically. Uh, typically to create a statically linked library, and these are the older sort of less favored uh, kinds of libraries these days because uh, in order to use them, you actually have to copy all of their uh, definitions uh, into executables. Uh, this is just a matter of creating a bunch of .old files. Uh, and over here, you see options like dash C, which indicate I'm not producing an executable. I just want to create a little .o file associated with this thing. And then you uh, invoke this little archiver tool. And uh, it has a bunch of options to uh, create a, a, an archive. And essentially, you just list a bunch of .o files along with where you want the destination uh, to be. This will merge all the .os into a sort of simple format that allows uh, compilers like GCC to quickly parse through and look in all of the .o files that are present in the archive. And you can see here that after creating this thing, I ask what kind of file this libdsearch.a is. It's a current uh, RAR archive file. And if you ask what's the table of contents for this, it'll show you all the .os in there. Uh, to that end, then, uh, you, this enables the compiler to search through these .os to find any symbols that are needed. Uh, in this case, we were compiling uh, a bunch of search functions that were pertinent to Project 4, for instance. Uh, things like linked lists and binary searches and arrays and trees and binary searches and those. Uh, so if you were to create a library that looks like this thing, uh, then this would be linkable uh, against other stuff. We'll see how in a second. The dynamic, uh, sorry, linking against those kinds of libraries uh, is relatively straightforward. Uh, the only thing that you'd need if you didn't have this library, this .a file in a standard location, is this set of options that allow one uh, to compile and locate though that stuff. Uh, and so up here, uh, you'll see I have this library, libdsearch.a, in a subdirectory called dsearchstatic. Along with it is a header file describing what are the functions that are actually available in the .os that are present in this thing. And if you were to compile this here uh, at this point uh, and say, hey, GCC, I have this main function, do search.c. Uh, I'd like to compile and make use of this DS search library that I just created uh, using a little archive of a tool. Uh, you probably get a couple problems. Uh, the first one uh, that you can't find the header file. And the second that even if you were able to resolve that, uh, it can't figure out how to link against this DS search library because the system doesn't know where it is. And this is mainly on account of the search for header files uh, taking place in either the current directory, as indicated by this uh, double quoting thing, or if you used angle brackets, uh, then the header file is searched for in standard locations. Uh, this is that slash user lib slash or slash uh, user include slash uh, user local include, etc. Uh, same thing too for this DS search down here. I can demonstrate this quick uh, if we jump over here to the code pack for today. 
and I come up to this, uh, I think it's DS search static here. Oh yeah, here, I have this uh, do search uh, uh, code right here. So all I need to uh, do is GCC this uh, do search dot uh, C and uh, link this DS uh, search. Oh, that's same. I think I got this right. Uh, yeah, DS search. Okay. Uh, and first and foremost, I got to change in here quick uh, to make sure I actually built the library. Okay, so go. Cool. Uh, so we ran a bunch of GCCs and then ran that little archiving tool here to make sure that the uh, static version of this library is present. I'll GCC this thing uh, and then get can't find this guy. And once I could resolve that, it still couldn't compile. Um, one of the giveaways what we'll deal with right now is you can tell the compiler where to look for additional header files by passing the capital I option and then listing the directory. Uh, so here, if I list DS search uh, the static, that's the directory that my um, library is actually located in. Uh, then I'll make it a little bit farther forwards. Uh, but then the linker will complain. Uh, so the compiler saying I wanted to insert this header file, couldn't find it. Later on, the compiler is like, cool, I got my job done. I produced assembly. But the linker complains that it can't find this uh, DS search library. Uh, and that's typically resolved. Let me uh, make my prompt a little shorter here. Typically resolved by uh, stating also, when you're looking for libraries, look in the following place. That's a dash uh, capital L, uh, DS search static. Uh, the compilation now has completed. I can run this little a dot out, which you know uh, doesn't do a lot right now. Uh, doesn't matter too much to me. Uh, and if you were to ask about this uh, um, file, ldv uh, a dot out, uh, or sorry, file a dot out, you find that it's a dynamically linked executable. Uh, and it's a mixed one. So it's been dynamically linked against the things that it could find, like the libc.so. But since it couldn't find a dynamic version, a .so version of DS search, uh, then it will have make use of the archive, uh, the static library, uh, to copy definitions in there. Uh, and so if I ask, uh, hey, a dot out, what are you dynamically linked against? You'll see the standard candidates here, uh, the Linux kernel, the C library, and the uh, loader. No mention here of DS search because no dynamic version of that library was made available to this. The expectation then is, uh, well, if I look in this a dot out, uh, there'll be a lot of symbols, but uh, symbols that show up in this library, such as binary array search, that actually should actually have a textural definition uh, in the a dot out because it's been copied in there. Uh, so let's start going to binary, uh, oh, sorry, linear array search. Uh, oh, did I, I mess this up somehow? Let's see. Uh, here's, uh, hmm, well, hang on a second, let me pause and figure out why I'm not finding the stuff. Ah, yes, okay, I was forgetting one critical aspect of this. Uh, GCC is a clever bugger, and despite there being a whole lot of functions defined in this DS search uh, static library, things to do binary search, uh, linear array search, and so forth, uh, in truth, the executable that's used up here only uses a couple of functions. Uh, make a sequential list and do uh, linked list searches within it. Uh, you'll see here that those functions have been copied in. So here's a linked list search, a list free, uh, make sequential list. They're all marked as textual definitions that have executable code. All the things that were in that .a library that aren't used by this are not copied in. And this saves space associated with uh, the executable both on disk and when it's loaded into running memory. There's no reason to insert the name or the definition for a function that's never going to be used in here. Uh, so to that end, uh, this is a mix executable that has some things that are going to be dynamically linked, uh, things like the printf and free functions uh, that are coming from the dynamically linked standard library, and then some statically linked stuff, uh, such as what's coming from that uh, static library that we defined. So then, one can see that generally creating a new 
library that's in this uh, static archive format is not tremendously difficult uh, and so too one can link against it using executables uh, that uh, you would produce and a standard sort of setup in the past was to create a statically linked archive uh, and then install it someplace in a standard definition on a system but barring that if you didn't have such permissions you can make use of options to the compiler but to get this thing uh, to work out all right uh, we uh, sort of observe then that there's an alternative to this that the more modern era is uh, uh, involves producing not statically linked but dynamically linked executables uh, and so the instructions that are listed over here are largely the same uh, when it comes to linking against those dynamic executable or dynamic uh, libraries uh, and the only difference is in the creation of the uh, dynamic library which involves some additional options gcc in order to produce a shared object, uh, then pass a dash shared option uh, to uh, GCC. Uh, this involves a, a linking process where you first have to have a whole bunch of the .c files uh, that are compiled to .os, but importantly, each of those has to be compiled with this so-called position independent code option. This allows those Exec, uh, the executable code that's present in here to be called from any particular virtual memory location uh, effectively. Uh, that's important because since these uh, functions that are in here are going to be loaded into a dynamically linked location and potentially multiple different executables with a different notion of what the virtual address for those functions is, uh, is going to be called. Uh, in that case, then they have to be position independent, that it doesn't matter if uh, this program thinks I'm at 1024 and this other program thinks I'm at 1,024,000, uh, that my code has to run effectively. Uh, to that end, then, uh, after creating a .so like this, uh, you'll have one of these L64 bit shared objects. Uh, and in, once you would sort of well, look at its dependencies, you may see that since the code in here makes use of printf and malloc and so forth, uh, then it has its own set of dependencies on things like libc. Uh, importantly, then, you can have these chains of dependencies where loading one dynamic library requires another to be loaded, requires another to be loaded. Um, this is is all taken care of by the dynamic loader uh, on a system, something we'll talk just a few minutes about. Uh, but when creating these shared objects, then uh, you just have to figure out which kinds of compiler options to pass in. Uh, the F pick when you're compiling the code the first time, uh, and when you're linking, uh, pass this dash shared option to it. So the final then uh, part of this uh, is to compile uh, uh, this do search.c, which is a main sort of executable, uh, and include the options that we did when we were linking against statically uh, linked dynamic ex or statically linked executables. Uh, this will um, in the past have copied in definitions uh, for all the functions that are needed here. In this case, we had that uh, linear or linked list search, uh, so it would have copy definitions in. But this time, uh, as you would produce the a.out, uh, then you would get this executable that doesn't have those definitions copied in. Instead, it's meant to uh, make use of the shared memory version of this DS search library, this uh, .so. Uh, you can see that over here, as I would in this present directory, uh, first change into that, uh, let's see, DS search dynamic. You use the provided make file uh, to compile that. You can notice all the options up here. Uh, and if I GCC as I did earlier here and just change this uh, DS search static to DS search dynamic, uh, then what I get here is uh, an uh, executable. Here's LDD, uh, uh, or say file uh, a.out. And you'll see that this thing is a dynamic link executable. Uh, importantly, if I don't run at this point, uh, I encounter a little bit of trouble. <laughs> uh, error while loading shared libraries. Uh, libds search cannot uh, open shared objects. No such file directory that's mentioned over here in the slide as well. Uh, you could further sort of supplant this uh, by saying, well, if there's a problem with this thing as a dynamic executable, uh, let's find out what its dependencies are. And the LDD that was mentioned in the slide, we'll reiterate it down here, LDD on a.out. And you can see, yeah, you're linked against these shared libraries. Uh, I found the C library at this location on disk. But importantly, this looks bad. That's the libds search.so that I linked against. It can't be found right now. 
Now, this seems a little bit idiotic because we just compiled it and told the compiler, hey, this is where it's located. Uh, but generally then, this kind of a problem, uh, you would need to resolve yet another step. And this is one of the primary differences between a statically linked executable and a dynamically linked executable that uh, there is another set of spots that things can go sideways when it comes to running dynamic uh, executables uh, and that is at the point of actually loading and running them that when this thing is going to be run as a program all of this stuff has to be available and found and clearly it's not found at this point the way that this is resolved then uh, is to specify not to the compiler where things are at because we've already done that but to the loader where things are at uh, and so this loader looks in certain spots uh, for dynamic uh, libraries, these .so files. If you can't find it, uh, flips out. You can further specify where it might look by using a so-called environment variable. Uh, in this case, ld library path. Uh, this is a special variable that is used not by the compiler or other programs, but by the loader uh, to indicate additional spots that it should look to find dynamic libraries to link in against an executable. Uh, let's see if we can uh, get this uh, to be sorted out right now. Uh, but there's some additional information here about environment variables. And generally, these are useful things to be aware of because they allow you to configure your environment so much as uh, to uh, how you want things to behave. Setting environment variables like what program is used to display text in your um, uh, terminals, a uh, so-called pager. Uh, this is a, a you know, potentially nice customization. Uh, and general environment variables are just that. They're variables that the shell keeps track of. So uh, down here, I can do things like x equals 5. Uh, and if you know the right syntax to echo what is 5, in this case, a or what is x, uh, in this case, a dollar sign, uh, then you can get those variables back. Uh, these environment variables then are variables that are searched for by certain programs as they would run uh, to dictate what behavior uh, is. Uh, anybody who's ever worked with Git before knows that if you forget to specify a commit message on the command line, then it'll open up an editor. Uh, and typically, one would specify what editor do you like to edit things in, and I much prefer Emacs. So if I forgot to apply a message to a Git commit, then I get an Emacs instance, which would allow me to quickly state what my commit message is and send it back uh, to Git for it to do its business. Uh, so in our case, though, we're interested in adjusting this LD library path variable uh, in order to tell this executable where exactly is this library that you can't find. And so a uh, typical sort of invocation will look at like this. Uh, you export LD library path and set it to be the location, in this case, a folder uh, where that thing can be found. I can do that down here. I'll say export LD library path uh, equals, and in this case, it's in DS search uh, dynamic. Uh, whatever that. Uh, now, if I run a dot out, uh, I actually get this thing uh, to run all right. Uh, interestingly, if I jump over here to uh, my second shell and ask uh, PMAP what's going on with this 16586, 6586, that's the process that's running, uh, you'll see a yet another new entry over here. Uh, this is that libdsearch.so. Uh, it's been found, and the loader has plopped it down in the spots that uh, shared libraries are stored when they're in use, and linked this running program against it. There's probably a way to determine what are all of the shared libraries that are loaded into memory at the moment, uh, and where are they located, and so forth. Uh, and generally, this is probably the only program on this system that's making use of libds search uh, data. So, so as I would finish up this program over here, that would go out of memory. But LD and libc, which are used by many programs uh, out there on the Linux system, uh, will probably stay in memory uh, as, for instance, Emacs, I'm sure, is making use of the standard library right now and it continues to run, so shouldn't get rid of that one yet. Um, so this gives you a sense then of the sort of different stages in this, uh, an important part of understanding the software architecture on most systems. Uh, and this is not a unique property of Linux systems at all, uh, or Unix in general. Uh, in fact, there's this uh, old uh, phrase, uh, aphorism, L uh, DLL hell, uh, on Windows systems, uh, rather than .so, there's a different format for their dynamically linked libraries, uh, DLL, uh, short for dynamically linked library, and in the past, Windows systems were notorious that they would upgrade certain things, uh, get rid of old versions of their uh, dynamically linked libraries, and this would cause many programs to stop functioning. 
and figuring out what library you need to reinstall in order to get the correct version of a DLL uh, to be able to run this or that game or program uh, was real hell on, on, on folks. Uh, so this idea of dynamic linking is widespread in computing systems. Expect to see it in one form or another uh, in various places as you do business. Now there's one final trick that's associated with this dynamic linking thing, uh, which is very interesting to study. Have a quick look at the following example in which we GCC a hello.c and we run it and see this uh, behavior of hello world printed out and uh, my favorite number uh, int is 32 and float is 1.234. Very standard looking program. You can imagine what the C code for this hello.c looks like. Here is an incredibly wonky uh, sort of uh, invocation of GCC and manipulation of the environment. Uh, you can imagine though that I haven't changed this uh, printf uh, uh, at all. So I'm still making use uh, here of this hello.c and the same a.out that none of this compilation over here has changed the a.out at all. Yet, when I rerun it, I get some markedly different uh, output associated with the program. That as I would run it down here, instead of just hello world, I see, but most of all, Sammy is my hero, and he really is. Take a moment, study this thing, and speculate just a little bit about what the hell has just happened in order to, without recompiling this a.out, produce different output down here. All right, so you should be aware now that there are some different phases in this process, that just because I have compiled this program, uh, hello.c, into an a.out, does not mean that this program contains everything that it needs. In fact, a notable mission here would be probably printf. This thing is clearly printing some stuff to the screen, and so it's going to be calling printf, but I wouldn't expect with default options to GCC that the definition for printf is in a.out. It's instead in a dynamically linked shared library uh, that is probably in libc. So as this thing is loaded up, it is linked dynamically against that libc so that printf can be accessed. This bit of wonkiness over here gives away a few of the sort of items that of interest about would dictate chain behavior changes down here. In particular, we're definitely compiling a shared object uh, as evidenced by the .so, as evidenced by the share down here, uh, a few other things. Uh, and over here, there's a weird little environment variable that's being manipulated uh, to add this presently created uh, libsami printf.so. Uh, it's, it's sort of tacked on to whatever this uh, variable does. Now, it's not a far, far cry then, based on the names of this libsami printf.so, uh, to imagine the following, that what we've just done is to create a new version of printf uh, and ensure that rather than the standard definition of printf that's used by this a.out, instead we dynamically link this thing to this version of that printf. And to that end, this is what changes the behavior of the a.out with ever uh, recompiling or manipulating the code. Instead, it's linked against this new version of printf and run uh, so that uh, you get, in addition to the standard printf output, uh, the print output that is down here, this, uh, but most of all, same as my hero business tacked on. Uh, the scope of like what's involved here doesn't you know concern us greatly other than to demonstrate some of the interesting tricks that you can get away with. Uh, so you can prove the fact that I'm now linking uh, dynamically against a new library by looking first at this a.out, asking what libraries it links against, uh, and here you'll see libc certainly. But after exporting this environment variable ld preload, uh, which as the name would suggest uh, indicates things you should load before other standard libraries. Libraries. Uh, then you can see that uh, by virtue of the fact this libsami printf.so is present, uh, then down here uh, is a additional entry, uh, this uh, libsami printf.so. Uh, that's in the list of stuff that is part of uh, what's going to be linked against uh, this uh, executable if it's run. And that was dictated just by changing this environment variable. Now, this is a slightly nefarious example. I wouldn't suggest that you go around and try and corrupt people's printfs and so forth, but it has its uses. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the tricks that Valgrind has used either presently or historically. I can't remember where they're at these days. 
In order for you to get additional memory protections through Valgrind, uh, it needs to override the definitions for standard, malloc, and free to add on some safe versions of that. Uh, in some runs of this class, we actually implement versions of malloc and free, but I didn't have enough time this semester. But if you wanted to make use of that malloc and free uh, that you wrote yourself, then you could use such tricks uh, yourself. This library interposition technique, uh, which is enabled through the loader looking at this variable and saying, is there any shared object that you'd like me to prefer uh, before loading the standard sets of stuff that I do. This allows you then to uh, get your own versions of malloc and free uh, safe through Valgrind or using different data structures that you might implement yourself if you're uh, writing it yourself. Uh, it's again beyond the scope of what we want to do in the class at the moment, uh, but it's a tremendously useful technique uh, if you are trying to debug or add logging facilities to stuff. You don't even need to modify the code that you are changing the behavior of. All you need to do uh, is load a different library that overrides the standard definitions for that stuff. The last thing that we're going to talk about briefly uh, is just to say a few words about uh, this technique we used early on in the class in which uh, we had to load global variables using this somewhat odd syntax. Uh, there's this uh, business, if you recall, of loading something based on a rip relative addressing, uh, as in the way that you would get the value of some global variable into uh, EDI is to move it from uh, this global variable offset from the rip. Uh, this is sort of, sorry, we deferred discussion of like why we do this because it wasn't always the case you used to be able to just access a piece of global memory and plop it down in there. Uh, but we're now in a position uh, to sort of talk about some of the security and safety measures uh, that's involved there uh, and also how this is even possible uh, because uh, the RIP business there is something that is uh, constantly changing on that front. And it introduces uh, something interesting about this uh, and that it calls to mind then some of the additional things that the linker has to do as it's creating executables, both uh, at the sort of static level and the dynamic level. If you were to look at when you would uh, sort of compile code that uses this, uh, we've used this uh, uh, semester a clock function, but uh, these days, or in the past, we've done things like thermometers and so forth. If you actually look at the object code produced with this and disassemble it, uh, convert it back, uh, then what you'd see is that there are a lot of zeros in spots associated with this. Uh, that uh, if you were calling some function that you wrote that was in a different .o file, uh, then it's very very likely that there would be a bunch of zeros there um, associated with that stuff. Uh, and similarly, as you would uh, work your way down just a little bit, uh, you'd see another spot where there are a bunch of zeros. Uh, and this is despite you having a very well-defined definition uh, for what this function is. Uh, your clock updates or uh, thermo updates uh, or battery updates uh, kinds of functions, uh, they should have a known address at this point because we're compiling it at that point. Um, so these two things are actually tied up together and deserve just a little bit of explanation uh, for this. Um, so part of this story has to do with the relative addressing modes uh, and the need for the linker to be able to relocate code. Uh, so let's quickly try to buzz through this uh, so we can make our way to the end of the course as it were. Uh, the linker has to take all of the global symbols that are in multiple .os and plop them down in a single executable or other .o. Uh, and the things that it has to resolve generally we discuss are where are functions and where are the global variables associated with this stuff. Uh, historically, the linker would just assign a virtual memory address uh, for this stuff, but uh, this forces a program, uh, the loader, uh, to be loaded, uh, load the program image into a specific location. We talked earlier in the class about how this uh, can create some security deficits. Uh, so, for instance, if I'm a hacker and I want a certain function to be run and I detect, ah, here at this spot, someone is unsafely reading characters and not counting them so I can overflow a buffer, then I have a fixed target, as in uh, the link or the um, linker has decided uh, when this program is loaded, the following function, uh, do unsafe stuff, is going to be loaded at virtual memory address uh, 2048. I can continually uh, hit that buffer and try to place bytes down so that 2048 appears where the return address should, eventually uh, enabling me to get the return instruction at the assembly level to return to that virtual memory address and run that code. 
GCC by default now to prevent that kind of attack uh, it always generates relocatable codes, uh, which allows the loader to pick arbitrary addresses. As in, at this instance of running this program, the function un run do unsafe stuff is loaded at 2048, but the next time you run that program, it's uh, loaded at 4096, and the next time you run it, it's at uh, 10,001. Uh, that movement of those functions around makes it much harder for buffer overflow attacks to effectively uh, find their location and then get arbitrary code to run. So it's generally uh, safer and more flexible, but it puts a lot more pressure on the linker to figure out what format should I plop down uh, this sort of uh, address for the function I'm supposed to call when I don't even know when it's going to be, uh, uh, where it's going to be when, it, when it's loaded. Um, so one thing that, that needs to happen uh, is there have to be some guarantees uh, between these. And what you'll find is that one of the guarantees that is agreed upon between your standard Linux loader and linker is that maybe the addresses will change over time, but the distance between the sections is always going to remain constant. Uh, and we've just talked about then that there's some text and some data sections here. Uh, and irrespective of where what addresses the loader puts these at, they'll always be the same number of bytes apart. Example, if the uh, linker decides, uh, or the loader decides, uh, at one instance I'm going to load uh, the text section uh, at address 9000, uh, and at the next time I run this program I'll run it at 9100, a decision that's made by uh, the loader and the OS, uh, then the text and the data will always be uh, 1000 bytes apart. So at the first time this is run, uh, the text section being at 9000, uh, then the data section will be at 9100. But if the next instance the text section is loaded at 9100, uh, then the next time this is run, the data will be 1000 bytes off from that, uh, so uh, 9200 instead. Uh, this means then that there's a fighting chance to have a relative address between uh, functions that are running and global variables, and that since text sections are always loaded contiguously, uh, you don't have this worry about then uh, having to calculate a relative addressing there. Um, so L files contain something that's known as a relocation entry. Uh, this is a little spot towards the end of the uh, 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 the ELF sections uh, that indicates spots that enable the loader to effectively load the um, executable into memory and then relocate anything uh, that needs to be moved around. Uh, for instance, uh, if a function makes use of a global variable, uh, and then there will be a relocation entry indicating that when this thing is linked, or alternatively even when it's loaded, uh, then some modification of that address needs to be made. Uh, relocation entries tend to be tied up with uh, function calls and global variable uses because uh, a spot that a function is actually called, that's when its address is needed. And global variables, when they're used, uh, this is also something then that needs to be patched in. So an individual dot O uh, doesn't necessarily know, have a specified definite uh, location for where a function call is, is located, but it does have uh, a sort of entry to say that at this spot and this spot and this spot, where those functions are called, uh, when I'm linked, you need to insert some something in there in order to fix this. Uh, there's a bunch of arithmetic involved in this that as you link, uh, you do, but important part is that ELF contains this section that makes it easy to sort of locate at this spot in the assembly code, we need to patch something using either a PC relative address uh, or a program procedure linkage uh, table. Uh, and this tends to be used more for the dynamically linked stuff. And importantly then, the linker just has to figure out as I'm merging multiple .os into executable, uh, this is the set of spots, these relocation entries where I'm going to insert an address. I think a specific example is merited here, and this will be among the last bit of code that we have to look at for the semester, so bear with me. On the left hand side, we have this little glob.c, and you can see it has a global array and a global function in it. In the global function one, uh, you see over here uh, that there is a call to glob func one, uh, making this thing uh, to some extent uh, recursive. Uh, and then uh, down here, there's a mention of a global variable. Uh, and this means then that these two things, both the function call and the global variable, they're going to need uh, some sort of a, uh, let's see, sorry, I, I believe I'm mistaken here. 
Okay, this actually is a, a, a improperly named. It should be just glob funk rather than glob funk one, so it's not recursive. Uh, apologies for that. Um, so this global array down here uh, then is being used within this. Uh, this guy has two uh, different things that need relocation entries, uh, glob funk one and glob array, as it were. Um, so to that end, you'll see in the relocation entries associated with the ELF file, and that's obtainable with this dash R option. Uh, there'll be a couple spots here um, that uh, first uh, this location 44 here uh, that or uh, location 66 rather uh, this is a spot at which uh, this glob funk one uh, needs to be relocated uh, and similarly down here there are a couple spots uh, where the glob array and the uh, printf functions also a global symbol they need sort of relocation as well uh, these are the addresses then if we looked at the dot o uh, portion of this this code uh, as and down here uh, did an object dump on this so you pass the right uh, options to see what is the disassembled assembly uh, in hexadecimal then you'd see at this uh, position uh, 65 uh, there is this uh, sort of a function call here and that e8 is the prefix in x86 uh, assembly for a function call but then a bunch of zeros here where you'd normally see an address for a function to be called uh, and importantly, the 6a that shows up here, uh, it is actually indicative of what's in the assembly uh, binary version, the opcodes at this point, because this is marked as a spot at byte position 66, where we need to insert a spot where uh, the address of where that function is actually uh, located after linking is done. And similarly down here, as you uh, would look at this load effective address for uh, this RIP relative uh, uh, sort of uh, address for this uh, glob array, that's a byte position 83. You can see the LEA, uh, that's this part over here, the first three bytes. But then again, a bunch of zeros over here that are in the .o file that indicates uh, this thing doesn't have an address yet. But it is marked as uh, needing a relocation. Um, so to that end, uh, this is spot then where you need the global array, uh, the address for where that thing is, uh, plop down in here. Finally, then, uh, printf is also marked in a similar way uh, that at the point that I call it here at uh, um, sort of uh, df here, you'd see this e8 uh, prefix again for a call, but then uh, at df, you tick over to e0, that's this address right here. Uh, it's a spot that I tend to call printf, uh, but a bunch of zeros show up here again because uh, the printf is not even present in uh, the, the code for that isn't present in this executable. And so it needs to be linked, and this will be a slightly different type because this is actually going to be a dynamically linked uh, a function instead. So uh, after sort of examining all that stuff, uh, and if you look now at if you uh, were to compile this thing and produce an executable with glob main and glob c together, uh, and then run this thing, uh, then you would see a couple interesting things. Uh, in the runs as you would go through uh, here, you'd actually see that these things are, as you run, uh, have definitions uh, for them, as in addresses for uh, the global functions and for the global arrays and so forth. Uh, these things are, are definitely uh, present. But as you would run things, as in first run of glob main, uh, this is an address, for instance, for that global array, ending 6060. Uh, when you run it a second time, it's actually at a different memory address, uh, virtual memory address, in fact, uh, that what was ending in 6060 ends in B060. So the global array has moved around on the sex second execution of this. Uh, it's actually been relocated. The constant that's uh, maintained here is that the distance between the text and the data sections uh, remains. Uh, so in the first run over here, we have this glob r, uh, and if you subtract off the addresses between glob r and main, uh, that's here and here, then you get a difference in hex of 2f07 bytes, and over here, the same difference of 2f07 bytes. That despite loading the text section and the data section at different virtual addresses between these two runs, they are still the same distance apart from each other. And this is why RIP relative addressing works, uh, that once uh, this executable is all linked together and you establish here is the distance in between uh, those two things, uh, then we can plop down an actual number 
for here for the rip relative addressing to say whenever I'm loaded uh, this thing is actually going to be uh, here two uh, two f zero seven bytes apart uh, from from where by those uh, two things are located. Uh, it's probably not that specific number, but it's whatever the difference is uh, between the start of the text section, uh, which is at a lower address, uh, than the start of the data section uh, that's in memory, uh, which is a higher address. Uh, this will be then the, uh, the along with a little offset uh, where you will find uh, this global variable and then whatever the sort of rip is uh, relative to that in the text section, you do a little arithmetic and you've got the position of that global variable. Uh, this flexibility then allows uh, the sort of address randomization here where things get loaded in uh, at different positions. Finally then, we didn't resolve how this works with dynamically linked stuff. Uh, this is a bit more involved, but uh, essentially boils down to the following. Uh, that as you would need to link in a dynamic function, uh, you set up a little table uh, in the executable uh, called the global offsets table. Uh, this is used then uh, by when you call printf, there's a little wrapper function around it that will inspect uh, whether or not this global position table has been filled in or not. And if it has been, uh, then you just call the function that's linked there uh, through a function pointer. And if not, then it will call this little uh, lookup uh, print uh, function where it will find printf within the dynamically linked uh, library, fill in that table entry, and then uh, plop uh, down uh, the actual printf call on that from. Um, all this sort of, uh, uh, sort of combines to give the following uh, general effect that you take a very minor performance hit the first time you would call a dynamically linked function like printf. But subsequently, it's pretty much as fast as calling any of the uh, sort of normal statically linked uh, functions. Uh, and to that end, it's a real wonder of engineering uh, that we get this dynamic linking behavior that enables all of these interesting features that we saw uh, with uh, in terms of memory savings uh, and disk savings, and also the dynamic features such as being able to uh, link against different versions of the library, uh, all through sort of clever, clever crafting of uh, this stuff in, in here. Uh, this is well beyond the scope of what I expect on an exam, but maybe of interest uh, to, to some of you on that front uh, for its careful sort of engineering part of that. All right, that brings us to the end of the course, and uh, I admit maybe I went off just a little bit uh, this time in terms of content. Uh, if you're looking to prepare along uh, exam-wise, uh, I'd expect you to at least sort of understand the basics of uh, not necessarily creating libraries, but making use of existing libraries through these dash L uh, options. Uh, so for instance, solving simple problems involving uh, I'm attempting to compile and I'm getting some sort of a linker problem, uh, such as uh, I don't know where the, the particular library is, be able to figure out whether that's a dynamic linking problem or a static linking compilation problem, uh, something along those lines. I'll, in the next day or so, post some additional examples and exercises to help you practice on that front. And the reason that uh, I'm thrusting this upon folks is that uh, they've heard of, had a number of students and personal experiences where you spend a whole summer just playing with trying to compile some big projects and getting the executable to get popped out after uh, sort of linking the right libraries and ensuring that system is configured so that the right uh, dynamically linked libraries are available at runtime as well. Uh, aside from writing code, this is an important part of uh, the business that we do in software development is just getting executables running. Uh, so to that end, it's worthwhile to know at least the basics of this stuff so you're not caught off guard uh, later on in your career. All right, that'll bring us to the end of today. I hope everyone is healthy and happy hacking until we see each other again. I'll be in office hours over the next uh, couple days to assist folks in finishing up projects and beginning preparations for the exam. Hope to see you there.